This may be the most interesting, most esoteric, most enigmatic man you've never heard of. Alexa Bormazovic is a Serbian gold medal starcher and special economic zone, offshore banking, and a corporation expert. He focuses on the nuts and bolts of decentralized economic independence and how these innovations can improve mobility technologies. And I know that sounds like a mouthful, but in this episode of The Freedom Files, you will learn a ton of things. One, how a near-death experience changed Alexa's life and how you can simulate one for yourself. What he's learned from ancient cultures, medieval war, and Yugoslavian communism. How he's creating a family legacy through technology, business, and breeding. Three things you wouldn't think go together. A treasure trove of book recommendations that have formed his worldview. What he's learned from working in special economic zones in the Middle East, here in Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, how he's set to evolve and advance the sport of Formula One. I know that sounds like a wild mix of topics, but trust me when I say esoteric. I mean it. Get ready for a mind-bending journey through the life and the story of Alexei Bormazovic. Enjoy. I'd like to start this conversation with a, a strange question. And, and since we are buddies, I, I know uh, the direction that you're going to lead me down. And therefore will lead into a really, really interesting conversation about your childhood, your background and, uh, where you're going in the future. So Alexa, tell me about what you have stored in your refrigerator at this current moment. That's a really good question. So, uh, in recent days, I've moved my diet to be way more Mediterranean, which is, than it normally is. And. To be honest, it is quite Mediterranean. So I, uh, I recently got some uh, Toma del Pastore uh, cheese out of Italy, a very, uh, very pungent, very hard hitting uh, hard cheese out of, uh, I believe, northern Italy. And uh, in addition to that, I've got some San Daniele uh, prosciutto in there. So uh, I'm trying to keep everything very, uh, very Mediterranean, very light meals. I'm, uh, I'm keeping it to less than uh, two fistfuls of food a day, uh, volume wise. And yeah, that's uh, that's what I've got in my fridge. In my freezer, though, uh, my family and I just uh, just cut down. Uh, we culled some of the uh, some of the cocks and uh, and hens over at the farm. So uh, I'm trying to, as much as possible, keep myself to either farm based stuff or uh, Mediterranean based stuff. What is the purpose of the two handful volume food diet? So uh, this goes directly into the story of uh, what makes me who I am. Uh, in November last year, as you may know, I had my uh, I had my appendix out and I had a bout of sepsis that brought me uh, quite close to the gravedigger's spade. And uh, thankfully, I was able to make my way out of that. Uh, since then, however, I've had uh, it's not necessarily a, a reduced appetite. It's uh, it's stronger than ever, actually. But the capacity of my intestines to handle food has been somewhat reduced. So with that in mind, I've decided to reduce the amount of food I eat volume wise, but uh, still making sure that I'm getting a lot of calories. I'm, uh, I'm, heavy, I'm the heaviest I've ever been. I'm at 85 kilos, which is even more than, uh, than before the surgery. And uh, the way I did that was just eat by eating extremely calorie dense and nutrient dense food. So I'm talking, you know, olives, olive oil, uh, meats, stuff like that. Interesting. And, and I imagine muscle, you're packing on muscle in the gym. Oh, absolutely. Is that right? Absolutely. The gym is, the gym is something that I do religiously and entirely without effort. And a lot of people that I meet, uh, tell me that they go there and it feels like they're, uh, like they're battling demons and that it's a difficult, uh, you know, trial to, uh, to go to the gym and move the weight. Whereas for me, it's, you know, 150 kilo dead, deadlift for six, uh, for six reps, uh, five seconds down. You know, I do this Menser style, uh, workout where, uh, where it's all about how slowly you put down the weight. Uh, Mike Menser, a uh, great, great build, bodybuilder from like the uh, 90s, 80s, I think. Uh, very cool guy. But anyways, uh, that's, uh, that's by the way. I've, uh, I've completely recovered from this surgery and the plan is to, uh, well, in November 
uh, when my alive day happens, so that's when my uh, when my surgery took place, uh, I'm going to be conquering Aconcagua, the uh, the highest peak of uh, of South America, and a couple of a uh, couple of our mutual friends will be uh, joining me in that. Incredible, that would be an emotional, powerful experience, especially shared with a bunch of friends. That's what I'm hoping for. Awesome. So Alexa, the reason I asked that strange question, which most people would think is a strange question at the very beginning of this conversation, is because you have a really interesting upbringing. You have a good balance between growing up in the city of Belgrade, Serbia, and the country, the, the farm that your family owns. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the balance between your city life and the country life that you you love both. What's the balance between those two? Certainly, uh, I do indeed love both. Uh, in terms of country life, there's a connection to nature that if you don't get during your formative years as a child, it never arrives. And then you become completely separated from things like hiking and interacting with animals and stuff like that. Whereas if you're completely separate from the city, you don't get the type of savoir faire and social interaction that one needs to, uh, to make it in today's world. So I'm very grateful to have had both of these uh, experiences growing up where I was able to, as a kid, you know, interact with uh, goats and chickens and, uh, and go out to the stream and catch fish and things like that. Whereas on the other end, uh, during my teenage years, you couldn't catch me from, you know, from 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. I was just out and about in the city, getting into adventures, causing trouble, uh, doing stuff with my friends, etc. And today it's uh, it's quite difficult to get get that balance right, because uh, we mentioned the city and we mentioned uh, the countryside and both of those are great. But there's one category there that. Uh, is quite uh, problematic, and that is the suburbs. Uh, I assume many people listening to us will be from the U.S. or uh, from uh, other places uh, with a similar uh, urban setup, and it's very problematic to grow up in the suburbs because you don't get the advantages of living in an inner city, and you don't get the advantages of living in the countryside. It's sort of the, sort of this insulated, uh, you know environment where uh, you don't you don't get really much except uh, free time to study and uh, I guess explore uh, explore the realm of ideas uh, when I was in the countryside I was able to explore my family's library and uh, learn a lot about well it, it wasn't so much learning languages but just seeing a book written in German and uh, not being able to understand it and then coming back to it 15 years later after I've uh, after I'd been to university in Vienna and uh, being able to understand it that is a sort of magical experience that uh, that I suggest anybody to do uh, I, I assume many guys listening uh, are uh, and many folks listening to this uh, to this episode are going to you know going to be founding their family soon or, or uh, they already have a young going family and one of the best things to uh, to consider is uh, how can you create the most magical formative experiences for uh, for the offspring? And this is part of my uh, tripartite uh, idea for legacy. And uh, I think I may have told you about this. I really, really love the Dune books by Frank Herbert. And, uh, you know, it takes place 10,000, 15,000 years in the future. And questions like, oh, does AI rise up and uh, enslave humanity? Questions like that don't even matter uh, 15,000 years from now, because in the book, in Dune, uh, that event, the AI rising up, that already happened and humanity's already liberated itself. And now, like, what's next? You know, so the book only asks, asks this question on a large enough time scale of tens of thousands of years when humanity's all around the universe. What matters? What is the only thing that really counts? And when you read into the book, there's really three answers to that. Answer one is technology. Answer two is organizations. And three is breeding. And my mission in life, obviously, beside uh, having a good time and traveling and all of the stuff that you'll normally hear from people, 
uh, my idea is to build a legacy that rests on these three legs. I want to build technology that's going to take humanity to places that it needs to go. I want to build organizations that will stand the test of time and be able to reproduce the create the results uh, that I'm pursuing. So that's to do, that's to do with creating governments, creating uh, obviously there's profit, there's stuff like that, but mostly I'm I'm looking to create uh, a state as a work of art. So a privately run city, for example, which attracts the best people in the world and offers a network of patronage. Uh, there's a there's an economic system that feeds that system of patronage. That's the type of organization that I'm looking for. And then finally uh, is breeding, which is uh, the longest uh, the longest idea of all. Because if you go back uh, down your own family tree, and I've been able to identify mine up to more or less the 14th century. Uh, if you're uh, if you go back far enough, somebody needed to think, oh, I'm going to build a long term legacy. I'm going to uh, instill within my progeny a certain type of value and certain types of knowledge. So this is one of the things that I felt when I was a kid. Uh, I was playing a video game, funnily enough, uh, Team Fortress 2. A lot of people played this. And uh, one of the characters allows you to use a bow and arrow. And I'd not touched a bow and arrow in my life before. But for some reason, using that video game character really felt right for me. So I go and ask the local archery club if I can join. And maybe a year later, I, uh, I got the gold medal in Serbia for 18 meter indoor. And uh, it's uh, it, that success I can ascribe only to rank genetic selection uh, hundreds of years ago. Like somebody in my genetic line was an archer of some sort, either a poacher or a, uh, you know, gentleman, uh, a gentleman athlete, uh, which I, the latter of which I, I prefer to believe in. And, uh, and, it, and this is what I believe in. You need to uh, feel deep in your blood what it is that your ancestors were, uh, were good at and continue to hone and sharpen uh, those skills and those achievements. Like if you were a, uh, if you were the son of a uh, or offspring of a diplomat or a warrior or an artist or a whatever, uh, that is the role that your genes have for you. And uh, the recombination with other forms of people uh, gives you more uh, more options for what you can become. Boy, you touched on quite a few topics there, um, and I told you before pressing record that I admire you as one of the most well-read, most poised and calculated people that I've ever met. One of the most interesting, interesting people that I've ever met. And that's going to shine through in this conversation so well. So I'm, I really, I really I'm, appreciate that, James. I'm, I'm very excited to dive into all these topics. I think the first thing that you touched on was the fact that these suburbs that have sprung up after World War II across the world, especially in these first world countries like the United States, Canada, Western Europe, they were born out of a good idea, right? That it was, it was uh, society's ambition to create a more peaceful uh, yet accessible life for millions of people. However, I think in the last few years, this has together with the advancements of technology and, and what modern society has now formed into, turned into a comfort crisis. And there, there's a, a tremendous book uh, by Michael Easter, where he writes about this comfort crisis, especially in the United States, but in, in Western society in general, where young people are growing up thinking, I mean, they're growing up in, in these suburbs and they're thinking, oh, life is safe. I don't need to take any risks. And as, as life goes on, the more comfortable I get, the better. But you have taken an, an exact different approach because you recognize that that's not the right way to live life. Um, I also really admire when you're speaking about your relationship with nature. And I've had something similar to that. And we talked about this the last time we, we spoke in conversation that I used to go to a summer camp every summer and every summer we, we progressed in the amount of exposure we would have to nature and uh mother nature so 
every summer we would do maybe a, a trip from this camp in northern Wisconsin. And the first summer, it was just a one day trip across the lake. We would camp there and then turn back and, and play with all the other kids, do horseback riding, archery, all that kind of stuff. And by the time that I was finishing my time there, eight years later, uh, we were doing 45 day backpacking trips in the Rocky mountains where we would not see another human for the entirety of that summer. And it would just be four or five males. And we would learn about stewardship. We would learn about stewardship with nature. We would learn about leadership. Obviously you had to have a, a really good sense of the people who you were, you were surrounded with because you would encounter all these different problems every single day, whether it was a bad map, whether it was a storm, whether it was food that went bad, whether it was whatever, or bears. Uh, so your, your attitude about nature is, is, um, I think something that is missing from most modern 20 year olds, 30 year olds lives these days. And I think that comfort crisis is, is largely, uh, to blame. Um, and I'll let you respond to that, but also I think another thing that people will catch on, uh, to throughout your conversation is that you really care about your family, you really, really care about your heritage and your legacy. And what did your upbringing so close to the city and so close to nature, what did that teach you about family and having a long time horizon? All right. So, uh, responding in no particular order, when you tell me about the comfort crisis, that's, uh, that's, it, that is the most interesting part of, uh, of what you said. And that's, uh, it was a, it was a pretty, uh, tight competition for what is the most interesting thing. Um, as far as comfort goes, I think it's the enemy of, uh, of achievement. It's the enemy of creativity and all that. I'm sure everybody listening to this understands that. But uh, how uh, how extreme my belief in this is might shock some people. Uh, in the 90s in Serbia, we had an extremely difficult situation of exiting from socialism. Uh, people called it market socialism. It was, a, I guess, a communism light. Uh, we, we were exiting from that and we had sort of the Bosnian Wars situation and there, and there was the Kosovo conflict and there was constantly low level or, uh, or high level, depending on the period, uh, levels of, uh, of warfare. Yet the cultural output of Serbia during that time, like most music that is listened to today in Serbia is, uh, is not from the 2000s or the 2010s. It's, uh, it's mostly all from the 90s. And this is reproduced in other cultures in other places in the world. You'll notice that uh, the greatest artistic achievement uh, in humanity was, uh, this is my opinion in any ways, uh, the Renaissance in Italy. And if you look at the political map of, uh, of that period, it was constant, these uh, mercenary condottieri captains uh, going at it against one another and constant court-based intrigue and assassinations and plots and uh, obviously open warfare with uh, with conscripted armies and professional armies as well uh that was the environment that of high pressure and competition that birthed forth i think one of the greatest periods of human existence i mean comparable probably to ancient greece and if you want a vision into uh what life was like at this point i strongly suggest the audio the autobiography of an artist called uh, benvenuto cellini so if you ever go to florence and florence is gorgeous uh the uh the loggia uh next to the uffizi gallery has this one statue and uh, i'm sure james will put this up uh, it's a statue of uh i believe theseus or uh, one of the greek heroes uh holding up the head of the gorgon and this is a this is a bronze statue the thing is, though, uh, this was done during a time when this guy was almost in complete penury. There was a war going on, and the metallurgy science of the time did not allow for uh, casting of the level that this statue required. So this guy was able to, in order to birth this piece of art, he was able to, you know, 
completely uh, not just isolate himself. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, Perseus, not Theseus. Uh, he was able to completely uh, isolate himself from the war within a city that was in war at the time and uh, devise new technologies for uh, for uh, metal casting and uh, and bronze. Uh, I guess uh, what's the word here? The uh, different uh, grainage of metal that's necessary for this type of stuff. Uh, phenomenal book. Uh, it also talks about how the, I believe it's the Pope or uh, or the local uh, despot that tries to poison him by uh, putting diamonds in his food. It's uh, it's phenomenal. Great uh, great story. But uh, but in in a similar vein, you've got the Sengoku period in Japan, which is sort of the Civil War period, the Warring States period, and uh, all of the greatest pieces of art that we associate with Japan, uh, including Kabuki Theater, including that one painting with the with the wave, uh, all of that comes from uh, from that period. And conflict and difficulty is something that births greatness. And hearkening back to what we were talking about regarding uh, which place, the city, uh, suburb, or uh, countryside you're growing in, I believe that suburbs uh, disallow and discontinue conflict, right? If you're in the city, uh, think of walking down a New York City street, uh, you're constantly being accosted, you have to uh, constantly be handling people, there's, uh, there's panhandlers, there's catcallers, there's all, you know, all sorts of interesting stuff happens in the city. There's uh, lots of these little nooks and crannies in, city where, in cities where you can get lost and you uh, find out these uh, strange, unusual groups of people and, uh, and things happening. And then on the other hand, you have the countryside. And in the countryside, especially if you're uh, if you're close to pure, unadulterated nature, where there's uh, where there's predators, then if you go through the forest and uh, you interact with a uh, viper or a uh, uh, fox or uh, or any t other type of uh, animal, uh, all of these interactions leave a very lasting impression. I've never forgotten any interaction that I've had with a wild animal, and the uh, I wouldn't call it the scouting uh, thing that you've done. It's uh, it sounds like more of a privately organized uh, expedition. Uh, that type of uh, growing up and that type of formative experience uh, entirely changes a man. The most the most unusual experience that a suburban uh, suburban childhood slash teenage years might have is you know oh we had a massive great party and uh, and I lost my virginity at that party etc like that it's very sad that, uh, that that's where uh, suburban life ends up whereas the formative experience of my childhood was something along the lines of I was in a for I was in the forest uh, walking around and uh, one of the nearby trees got smashed by lightning like that's a uh, I guess that caused me to be forever in awe of nature and uh, to a lesser extent and I'm not sure if you want to go to this uh, part of the conversation as well uh, spiritually I became in awe of the uh, of the gods of uh, the gods of nature so to speak the natural forces Boy, I, I think the the main message from what you just ran through that will stick with me for time, I think, is the fact that conflict and difficulty breed greatness. Because when you think about the all-time greats, Marcus Aurelius, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, all of the uh, George Washington, all of these guys obviously had tremendous difficulty, wars conquest and they wouldn't have been the historical men that they are they wouldn't be revered by societies all around the world had they not gone through those wars had they not gone through such uh positive transformations in their lives but at certain times in their lives they probably looked at themselves as tremendous failures and uh they probably didn't see light at the end of the tunnel and through that conflict, through that difficulty, they hardened themselves, right? And that bred the the great stars, the great literary heroes, the great uh, war heroes that we now know today. Um, and of course, that that leads into your time preference. Obviously, you want to be remembered as someone who led your family through something like that conflict, something like uh, difficulty. Um, and in Serbia, that's obviously a testament to what you were saying about the 90s. 
is a little bit easier to find, I think, than in the United States or in Canada or in Western Europe. When I first met you, we were introduced by a, a great mutual friend of ours. You asked me what my goal is. I thought, huh, this is a, a profound question for someone who I've just met. And I, I responded with a, a diatribe about freedom and being able to leverage my time and building a family. And then I asked the question of you, I, I returned the question and I will never forget this for as long as I live. You whipped out a pocket sized cigar box and you pointed to the emblem on the front of that cigar box. And you said this, this is my goal. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Obviously, I know what you're talking about, but can you explain that to the listeners? Do you mind if I, uh, if I go and get the cigar box real quick? Please It'll do. take me only a couple of seconds. Uh, this is the uh, cigar box that we were discussing. So uh, as you can see, there's a family emblem there. There's uh, eagle in sable uh, in chief, which means uh, black eagle at the top of the coat of arms. Then there's a uh, blue fess. Uh, which is this uh, band in the middle, which uh, signifies a river. Then there's a Jerusalem cross and uh, and six red spheres. So somebody in my family in the 1300s was at the Battle of Kosovo, uh, at the La River, which was the left flank of the Serbian military at the time, and uh, that's why they have the eagle uh, perched on the uh, on the river. And then the Jerusalem cross is because, again, that same ancestor had gone to Jerusalem. And because he made the pilgrimage, he had the privilege of putting down the Jerusalem cross uh, on his coat of arms. And then finally, the six uh, the six spheres, and I'm sure you've seen this, the Medici coat of arms, for example, has, uh, has three spheres on it. And uh, it means essentially a banker or a pawnbroker, and uh, that's the uh, that's the history of uh, of my family's coat of arms. And when I showed that, the intention was that I want to be worthy of this symbol. I want to be a man who can genuinely create something uh, worthwhile that uh, that will echo in history. And when we talk about Marcus Aurelius, and when we talk about uh, Alexander the Great and Caesar, etc. Uh, it's important to understand that these guys probably did not live very happy lives. And one of the biggest concerns that I have is that today, uh, happiness with one's lifestyle is what is being promoted as the goal of living. And for the majority of people, that may well be the case. However, I think there's a class of people that needs to put greatness much above uh, much above happiness. And in order to achieve greatness, there are certain things that need to be sacrificed. Uh, the thing that I'm particularly uh, mindful of is that I can't just be uh, spending time with my family and, uh, you know, having lunch and all that. No, there needs to be uh, there needs to be discipline and work toward the tasks that I mentioned. If I only uh, raise children and uh you know and love them and uh, put them out on the right path and all that the best that i can hope for is uh, a childhood you know 10 to 20 percent better than uh, than what i had in a life uh 10 to 20 percent better than what i had and that's simply not good enough for me uh what i think everybody here would benefit from is understanding exactly how limited the time is that we've got and uh, i almost died uh november last year because of uh because of the appendicitis thing greatness is something that needs to be paid for in the short term and honestly the more you feel like you're doing something that's making you happy in the short term the more you can rely on that instinct as something that is actively detrimental to uh, to long-term greatness and you know you can do all of the Marcus Aurelius uh, stoicism reading and your know, cold plunges, etc., and all that's fine. But uh, the only thing that people remember is uh, is what you've achieved. And to this end, uh, there's another book recommendation that I would make, which is uh, Plutarch's uh, Lives of the Eminent Greeks and Romans, also known as uh, the Lives. And this book uh, is a series of biographies of uh, various both mythical and, uh, and historical persons in Rome and Greece. And the way that one 
starts to think about life after having perceived these historical uh, these historical persons and what they achieved is you see somebody with a anecdote from their childhood where uh, they're playing dice in the street with their friends and they're like 12 years old and a cart comes out uh, in the middle of the road and the person just won't stop rolling the dice you know they'll just stay in the middle of the road uh, and, and stop the cart i think that's uh, alcibiades one of the uh, one of the greeks and that story uh, stuck with people so hard that uh, you know 2000 years after this guy died people are still talking about it um, and then th the skip happens from when he's 12 years old having this story to, I don't know, 21 when he joins the military. And in the meantime, he's, you know, he's had girlfriends, he's had heartbreak, probably made some money, got into fights, uh, went to the gym. Like he did a hundred thousand things and none of them matter. He traveled, he learned languages, none of it matters. None of it is uh, recorded in the history books. And the thing that is recorded in the history books is the fact that once he uh, once he entered the military, he uh, essentially defiled the uh, the statue of the city's patron gods, and then he became a wanted person. He ran away from his home city and went to Persia until he was caught in bed with the emperor of Persia's wife, and then he es he escaped to uh, to the mountains somewhere, and uh, they send an assassin squad. The I think the Spartans send an assassin squad after him, and he dies in a blaze of glory. Like that, all of that is. Uh, is top uh, top quality uh, like this guy Alcibiades is probably in league with Caesar and uh, and Alexander in terms of just how much he affected uh, classical Greece like pre Alexandrian Greece and uh, I strongly recommend if you're going to read only one uh, story out of there uh, it would be Alcibiades um, the second two that I would also recommend though not as much as Alcibiades is uh, Sertorius which is a Roman general and then uh, the other one would be Timoleon, which is a Greek guy who uh, who ousted a bunch of Sicilian tyrants. Very uh, very fun story. Um, but in any case, uh, that's that's my thoughts on greatness and comfort and where uh, where you get one and how to commit to the other. And when I said organizations, breeding, and technology, those are the things that will stay for a long time. And I guess works of art, though I define that in my system as technology. Yes. I think this, of course, you have this in your blood um, from the very beginning. From the moment you were born, you had this drive to maintain your heritage and your legacy for generations to come. You had that since you were born. However, I think that near-death experience really put things into perspective for you. Apart from forcing appendicitis on yourself <laughs> or or putting yourself in in such dangerous way, or maybe that's what you would recommend. How can someone create that same drive and deter determination to create a legacy for themselves and their family um, without having something accidental happen? To, because obviously you weren't looking for a near-death experience. You weren't looking to have near uh, uh, appendicitis and almost lose your life. How would you recommend someone go about that to get that same perspective that you now have because of it? Right on. So before uh, before the appendicitis, before all that, at that point, I'd already been climbing Kilimanjaro and doing skydiving and uh, you know all of this uh, all of this stuff I'd already been doing, and I can't say that any of it woke me up. As much as the uh, as much as the appendicitis did, and I got threatened by at, at knife point, and I was uh, close to a shooting, and all of this uh, all of this stuff happened. Yet none of it really hits you as much as uh, as being uh, as your body, your physical integrity being uh, being hard by this, because everything else, you know, if you jump out of an airplane, it's uh, it's two minutes of adrenaline, and then it's an easy return to normalcy in the everyday. If uh, if a shark bites down on the cage that you're inside of, uh, sure, it's a it's a bit of a thrill, but it doesn't really do anything. And the problem is all of these, quote, extreme experiences happen in a vacuum where there's actually very little at stake. Uh, they're uh, the the sandblasted and uh, the serial numbers filed off 
of these experiences compared to what I mentioned previously, the interactions with wild animals that uh, that have a much more uh, significant natural uh, connection to your body. Where and so that's uh, that's one thing that I would exclude, sort of the extreme sports side of things. Um, one thing that does uh, genuinely change one's uh, one's look at life is your own bodily integrity being threatened so you know don't don't, don't go cutting yourself that's not going to do it that's still too controlled so it needs to be a threat to your bodily integrity and it needs to be real risk that you can't really uh that you can't really control for if it's something like uh going to an mma fight you're getting there but it's still not the same uh if it's uh if it's being in war and getting shot and barely making it out alive that's the thing Right. Uh, an MMA fighter doesn't celebrate his alive day uh, when he gets out of the ring. Uh, skydiver doesn't uh, doesn't do it. But uh, but soldiers do. People who have had illnesses do. And, uh, you know, if you get mauled by an animal, if uh, uh, I don't know, I, the, the, any activity that genuinely puts you in danger, not uh, not pretend danger, but genuine danger. Uh, is what I think would uh, would work to shake people out of this. And perhaps some of it is uh, some of it is not you can't intentionally reproduce it because if you try to do it intentionally it's going to act as if it's fake yes and and that's what i withdrew but that's what i drew from what you were saying so from a man who uh, seemingly has so much poise and calculation in his life such as you putting yourself in uncalculable experiences not skydiving because you know you're going up in the plane, you know you have to jump, and you know that life is going to return to normal upon landing on the earth again. That's calculated. Kilimanjaro, calculated. Knife point, uh, robbery, and, and a shooting, those are accidental and not calculated, right? But you can't put yourself in that kind of experience. So I think the the threat to bodily integrity and and the risk that you cannot control you you find those things by just living an absolutely interesting life putting yourself in weird situations and taking risks in life and that's the exact opposite of what we were talking about before when i said that we're living through this comfort crisis right in the western in in western society people aren't comfortable with risks People aren't comfortable with the fact that they might fail at something. That That is a, a risk to their integrity. That's a risk to their soul. That's a risk to their legacy, if they're even worried about that. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the answer to that question that I originally asked you was by putting yourself in very interesting scenarios and increasing your luck surface area, just eat, meeting... A, a, very interesting people going to very interesting places that people have not gone to before is the way to uh, make yourself more resilient, right? And and to experience things that will absolutely change your life and change your legacy. On that same note, I have a question about what you're doing now and what you'll be doing in the future. So. Again, I, I heard from a, a mutual friend from our, of ours that some of the most interesting work that you do uh, across the world is in special economic zones in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America. Can you first explain what a special economic zone is? And then we'll get into uh, what you do in these zones and, and what your future goals are. Certainly. So special economic zones are essentially industrial parks or uh, economic development parks or uh, any other type of facility or area which has been geographically uh, lined out. And the government says that different regulations apply in this area. The reason that's done is so that you can attract investment into the country. And instead of, you know, uh, instead of completely abolishing taxes in the entire country and saying, all right, come one, come all, you know, everybody can come in and do foreign, uh, foreign investment into the country. Instead of doing that, you can control it by having this small dedicated area 
And because you have this dedicated area, you have various uh, spillover effects that are uh, that are usually quite uh, quite good. So if you concentrate manufacturing or uh, business process outsourcing in uh, into a single industrial park, then uh, people meet each other, uh, clients get made, relationships happen, all of this uh, knowledge gets uh, gets reproduced, all of this stuff happens. So that's why special economic zones are made. And I got into special economic zones around 2016, 2017. Uh, when I wrote a paper called uh, ICOing a Special Economic Zone, and uh, I co-wrote it with uh, with two other people, but uh, that was actually my first professional engagement ever, 2016. Uh, so what I did there was uh, I analyzed the Special Economic Zone as a real estate uh, investment and figured out how to distribute that through uh, through essentially uh, an ERC20 token or uh, or something along that, those lines, and uh, and since that. Uh, I'd uh, I'd joined a company that uh, that was a, a, economic, a special economic zone intelligence company uh, founded by a friend of mine, and uh, I can I can say the name. It's called Adrianople Group, like the Battle of Adrianople, and uh, this company went uh, went all around the world. Uh, we uh, we went to well, this isn't me, but uh, but the the company had gone to India, to Costa Rica. I myself went to South Africa and Kenya. Uh, UAE, all of these other places, and uh, what we would do is we would uh, consult special economic zones on how best to attract investment, uh, what new types of technology or new types of client should be uh, located therein, and uh, and things of that nature. And the reason I think this industry is uh, is so interesting, and by the way, sixty percent of global trade, which is many, many trillions, 60% of global trade goes through special economic zones. So this is an absolutely massive industry that nobody talks about and nobody knows about. And uh, what little SEZs uh, one can find uh, online, usually the registration process for these places uh, is uh, is completely opaque. It's not clear how one goes there, uh, what the advantages are. It's uh, it's it's a very opaque industry, and I think it's uh, it's still very much in its nascent phase. Uh, what's going to happen, in my opinion, is these special economic zones are going to be the at the forefront of something I like to call I like to call governance ephemeralization. Uh, government governance is going to uh, shift from the level of uh, national governments to the level of these industrial parks or city states or uh, or similar level entities, and this is the thing about uh, about political organization. We've lived for a very long time in this uh, nation state paradigm. And although we had this one period of the Cold War where uh, you just had the communist bloc and the U.S. capitalist bloc, uh, both mm -hmm. nuclearly armed and able to uh, to destroy one another, uh, it, we still had all of these uh, all these small countries and uh, oh, are they Soviet satellite states? What are they? And I think that for some reason the Cold War was a unique time in history where uh, where the polarity of ideology was able to split up the world like that and uh, uh, stop what would normally uh, happen as a historical process. And the historical process that I'm talking about is the development of governments as something downstream from, uh, from military technology. Uh, back in the day, uh, in like ancient Mesopotamia, you'd have uh, the city-states of Ur and Uruk, and uh, you know these uh, these Sumerian cities, and the reason they were uh, they were built that way is because the most advanced technology one could build was essentially a bronze blade and maybe a chariot, and then uh, somebody figured out how to throw javelins uh, in a in a specific way to eliminate the chariot, and then uh, different uh, a different type of uh, a different type of states get, state gets organized where a single city can manage a larger empire. So then you have the Akkadian Empire, and then uh, somebody somebody figures out the uh, somebody figures out horseback riding, and suddenly you have the uh, you, you have the Hittite invasion where they it's not really a country, it's just a big swath of territory where uh, these horsemen roam free and exact tribute from the cities, and then uh, somebody figures out how to create. Uh, anti-cavalry spear formation and then you know this uh, there's constantly this uh, attack and defense uh, development of military technology and the way that uh, violence evolves 
is uh, is upstream and affects how uh, civics and how uh, the way that we organize our societies uh, functions. So most recently, uh, we've entered, we've transitioned from, I'd say, the nuclear uh, the nuclear race of, you know, let's get as many warheads as we can, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and now we're moving into this drone swarm, fifth generation, uh, DDoS attack style warfare. And uh, I don't think that the governments and, uh, frankly, the system that we have in place of, you know, uh, state level national governments, I don't think is uh, is congruous at all with the level of military technology we've got. So when we said about the uh, the comfort of uh, of living in uh, in the here and now, I'd say that we're closer to discomfort and warfare and uh, the proverbial Sengoku period of the USA happening in the next you know ten to twenty years. We're closer to that now uh, than we are to uh, to the 90s which at this point have been what 20 uh, more more than 20 years ago and you know uh, i may have uh, expanded a bit from the original question about sez and SEZs, and i'll gladly go back into the business side of things but uh, i just uh, i just caught myself thinking about this of course and i think it's pretty apparent the tie in between your big life goals of creating this legacy through military technology organizations and, and governments and procreation how that ties in with these special economic zones is pretty clear mm -hmm. um where where do you see your role expanding from here obviously you wrote this paper called icoing a special economic zone is that right i think it's called icoing a city icoing a city okay i will link that below in the description for people right. to if, if there is a link uh, for people to, uh, read that document, but so you wrote that paper and now you've physically, uh, participated in a lot of these special economic zones was your goal personally, Alexa, uh, in these special economic zones. And especially as it relates to your legacy, your heritage. For sure. I mean, a lot of people will, uh, will just bask in the reputation that, oh, I went to these special economic zones and now I'm an expert and now I'll just do consulting gigs and uh, and get paid for it. A lot of people will just do that without any mind to what does this mean in the larger historical context. Uh, whereas for me, it's only the historical context that matters. And here's what's mine. Uh, when I said military technology and when I said organizations, uh, here's what I want to develop in life. The largest company in the world today most people would say Apple or, uh, or something like that. No, it's Saudi Aramco. And uh, the reason why they're the biggest company is because they're in energy and energy is required for everything. So when one thinks about what is the biggest company going to be 300 years from now, the obvious answer is still energy, maybe not Aramco, but still energy. And what are we going to use for energy? Might be fusion energy, might be uh, solar might be something else i'm a firm believer in uh, in hydrogen being a uh, being a part of it maybe as fusion maybe as fission maybe as something else but uh, but hydrogen for sure and uh, one of the businesses that i'm uh, that i'm looking to build is a research and development park for uh, for specifically hydrogen uh, manufacturing and it would start with hydrogen motorsports so a sort of sexy industry that uh, that people can see themselves getting behind and then uh, expand from that into uh, into more concrete things. So I'm talking uh, I'm talking measuring instruments, valves, like very unsexy uh, parts of this uh, unsexy parts of this industry. And uh, and then b uh, based on that, uh, you'd have this research and development park that's uh, that's got high precision manufacturing for, uh, for hydrogen motorsport. It's got these uh, infrastructure uh, development pieces. Uh, companies that do retrofitting of existing natural gas pipelines for hydrogen you know stuff like that and uh, and then it would go into aviation and then finally uh, aerospace and particularly aerospace military technology so i'm talking uh, uh weapon systems on satellites uh, there's this uh, old uh, i think 1980s project for uh, getting a satellite up in orbit and loading it up with a bunch of tungsten rods and uh, just dropping these heavy rods from uh, from low orbit, and by the time they reach the ground, it's something like Mach 5, 
and uh, because it's like 900 kilos of tungsten going at Mach 5 at the ground, it's like a tiny meteorite strikes the uh, the place, and there's zero biological uh, uh, zero biological weaponry there, there's zero chemical, nothing radioactive there. It's just completely like kinetic. Uh, pure kinetic force, and uh, I'm curious what type of state uh, system would get developed based on this becoming the mainstream military technology. Uh, would it be, you know, like that one movie Elysium, where uh, every all the rich people live in a space station and uh, the world is essentially one big favela? Um, I'm wondering if that's the type of society that comes out of that. And, you know, it doesn't really matter if uh, if I do this or not. Somebody else is going to. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, that history moves forward whether you want to or not. And if I don't develop this uh, hydrogen technology and build my own uh, build my own legacy, somebody else is going to. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to think about. You constantly need to think about, oh, uh, what's this going to look like 200, 300 years from now when I'm gone? But you also need to think about what do I do next Tuesday to make this happen? So from what I understand, and we haven't talked too much at, at length about this, but you're somehow involved with uh, Formula One and and starting to test these uh, fusion and fission products of hydrogen as what you see as the future source of energy for the future population, the future civilization of tomorrow. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that involvement? Uh, it, you may be limited to, to what you can say, but, I'll respect that. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to talk about uh, those special economic zones that you see as heading in the right direction. So where can you work on uh, these hydrogen products and this future source of energy where you get incentivized, where governments cooperate with you and not only cooperate, but also promote uh, that innovation and that development. So first, let's discuss Formula One. Certainly. So uh, Formula One is, uh, as everybody knows, the, the most expensive sport uh, per player on the planet. And uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm seeking to get is Formula One, Formula One to develop Formula H or H2. Uh, that would be, for me, a natural outgrowth of, uh, of, the, of the Formula One system. And uh, the the thing is, hydrogen isn't necessarily the most efficient way. I'm, I'm, by the way, when I say hydrogen, I'm not talking about hydrogen fuel cells, which a lot of people think about. Hydrogen fuel cells just turn hydrogen into electricity, and uh, the drivetrain is electric. So that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is hydrogen combustion. And uh, there's uh, there's something called the Toyota Gazoo uh, race, and it's a sort of uh, endurance uh, race endurance event. Uh, where they tested out a hydrogen combustion engine in essentially a production car, and uh, and it it behaves quite well. Uh, they figured out a lot of the technical uh, bits of it, like hydrogen embrittlement of uh, of motor comp components. The the Japanese have been able to engineer that stuff away. So uh, it's very it, it's a very exciting direction that the hydrogen motorsport industry is taking, and I'm looking to be an early. Uh, an early adopter in that regard. And in terms of the special economic zones that would be best amenable to this, and since I've already got my uh, my fingers in these pies, I'm, uh, I'm perfectly willing to say it, there's two places that I think are uh, well positioned to take this uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen project uh, off the ground, so to speak. Uh, one would be, uh, particularly in the GCC countries, Oman, since they already have a big investment in the uh, in the hydrogen industry, and uh, they're in the middle of every single trade route on the planet. Like you cannot uh, you cannot get something from China to, let's say, Europe without passing by Oman. Uh, or and if you do uh, if you do go straight to the U.S., uh, there's a different story that I'll go into right now, which is uh, which is Guyana. Uh, the uh, the only English speaking South American country, and recently it's been in the news because uh, it's had something insane like year over year forty percent GDP growth. And uh, there's a uh, there's a good friend of mine, uh, Trishrand. I'll uh, we can link that podcast uh, down in the description. Uh, he uh, he talked to a guy about uh, what's going on on the ground in uh, in Guyana and what's the uh, what's the upside for people going into this market? And uh, obviously, when you have the oil industry adjacent to that, you have a lot of something called blue hydrogen, which is uh, which is derived 
from the uh, which is derived from the products that would normally uh, normally take place in the uh, in the oil and gas industry. And the the most important thing I'd say about both French, uh, about not French Guyana, sorry Guyana, the uh, the English speaking one, as well as uh, as well as Oman, is both of these places have coasts that look towards the east. And the reason that's interesting is uh, both of these places uh, would be interesting for me as potential sites for a space launch facility. So when you've got motorsport manufacturing and when you've got valve manufacturing and all this stuff, and then you've got aerospace uh, companies, it's a hop, skip and a jump away from uh, from satellite launch and uh, and things of that nature. And the reason why it's uh, it's important that you have a coast that looks to the east is when you're launching a uh, rocket, uh, you don't want to be launching it over populated centers. But what you can do is uh, you're, you you're making use of the way that the planet turns. So let's say the planet is turning this way and you're here and it's turning this way and you launch it like that. So you get the slingshot effect of the planet's rotation. Uh, and both of these places make use of that. And not to mention, both are in the middle of a lot of trade routes. So that those are the places that uh, that I'm looking to mobilize this project in. And if anybody listening to this is uh, is interested in this project, I'm uh, I'm looking for people to do this with me. I've already got a uh, a partner with me who developed a racetrack inside of a special economic zone, and uh, we're uh, we're talking to both of these places, and uh, these these conversations are happening. From what I know, Guyana's also home to the European Union, the European Union's space facility. Are that that is that is French Guyana. That's French Guyana. Okay, correct. So, uh, so the and this is the fascinating thing about French Guyana. A lot of the experts who used to work on the French Guyana space launch facility in South America. Uh, a lot of those experts are still around. A lot of the people who operated the infrastructure, et cetera. So you can literally just pay them a ship ticket and they'll come over to uh, to Guyana and work on the space launch project there. So this stuff, this stuff writes itself. And for uh, for Oman, uh, it's a bit less of a it's a bit less that there's uh, that many uh, space technicians in one place, particularly like cheap uh, available uh, space uh, space tech technicians. But uh, but here's the advantage that uh, that Oman has: they've got pretty much like if this were to be built, they would have the only feasible uh, space launch commercial space space launch facility in the Eastern Hemisphere because the Chinese ones are uh, military only. Uh, none of the other countries uh, have their own uh, space launch facilities, and the Russian one uh, that's in Kazakhstan, so the Russians own this little bit of territory inside of Kazakhstan called Baikonur, uh, nobody can use that because Russia's under sanctions and seems to be, uh, that's going to seem, to me it seems that that's going to be the case for the next couple of years. And, uh, and you're able to capture these massive space launch markets, Pakistan, India, UAE, Saudi, uh, Indonesia, all of these places can be uh, can be serviced by a space launch facility in Oman. And uh, that's sort of the unique advantage that both of these places have. Incredible. Serbian gold medalist archer turned hydrogen innovator. I, I don't know if you would call yourself a chemist, but it almost sounds like it. <laughs> Man, what what a what a story, Alexa. Uh, and I'm, I'm 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 currently in the middle of an. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm currently in the middle of an exercise. Uh, I, I already told you that I did this once, but I'm doing it again. I'm writing my own Wikipedia page, and the way that I did that was I wrote my life's course uh, up to the day uh, up to the day of writing, and then you pause there and you think, okay, so what comes next? And what I do is I, uh, you know, how every Wikipedia page starts like, uh, you know, uh, George Washington was a general and plantation owner and president and whatever. And I started like, okay, Alexa Bramazovic is, and then I started listing these things out. And then uh, instead of thinking about what he, uh, what Alexa is going to do in 2026, I go, no, how does Alexa die? So I go to 2080. Like giving myself 82 years of life is probably uh, generous, but not uh, not outstanding. 
And uh, I just say that Alexa at that point is going to go into the mountains of uh, Herzegovina and he's going to perform Soku Shinbutsu, which is uh, ritualistic uh, self starving and self mummification. Uh, that for me, and you know, I'm just going to be surrounded by animals and uh, looking at the uh, looking at the pine covered sunset. That's the that's the way to go, in my opinion. Not in a bed surrounded by my family, no, thank you, but uh, just by eating. Uh, eating pine needles for three months whose uh, whose resin was going to mummify my insides like completely dehydrate me and uh, and eventually I just uh, I just pass away so okay cool I figured that out and then what I do and then you just start backing up backing up backing up like oh he did this with his uh, with his children but what did he do before that and then you just keep go uh, thinking from the final end backwards right you just keep thinking backwards what was the step before that what was the step before that and then before you know it you arrive uh, you arrive at the at next tuesday and uh, you know exactly what you need to do then the the listeners of this show and those who have been longtime readers of the freedom files know that uh one of the biggest catalysts in my life came three years ago when i wrote my own obituary very, very similar exercise as to writing your own Wikipedia page. Yes. You envision your life at the very end and you write about who's surrounding you, the impact that you've had on them, what they say about you when you have passed, the legacy that you have left, and all the achievements that you have uh, made in your life. And when I wrote that obituary, I realized that the path that I was going down was not going to lead me what I wanted to achieve by the time I died, when I was 90, 95, 85, whatever that age may be. And that led me to, in very quick succession, quit my job, start my own business, leave the, my home country and explore 10 different countries in the, in the following two years, completely changed my life. And... Writing your own Wikipedia pages it sounds like an extremely similar experience. One of the things that your your vision for how uh, you will pass on reminded me of a quote from one of my favorite books, and that is Into the Wild by John Krakauer about a, a man who, man, really, um, what I was just saying realized that he wasn't living the life that he really wanted to live, graduated from Emory University in, in Atlanta, great school, was about to go to Harvard for law school, and everybody in his orbit thought the same. Cut up his driver's license, cut up his social security card, donated all of his life savings, and instead went to Alaska. And that was his mission. Uh, I'll, I'll leave out the details for people who want to read the book or watch the movie Into the Wild. The quote that I just mentioned that your story reminds me of is the joy of life comes from our encounters with new experiences. And hence, there is no greater joy than to have an endlessly changing horizon for each day to have a new and different sun. And I absolutely love that quote. It's one of the few quotes that I can actually remember. In, in this low IQ brain up here. Um, with that, with that quote, Alexa, I think this is a good transition to uh, terminate this show. One last question I do want to ask you is, like I said at the very beginning, you are one of the most well-read, uh, most poised, most calculated, most interesting people I have ever met in my entire life. And I have met a fair share of people, a fair share amount of people. What books would you recommend for those who are wanting to learn about special economic zones or legacy creation or uh, any of the things that we talked about today? What books would you really recommend? I know Dune would be at, at close to the top of your list, but are there any others that you would really recommend? Uh, all of the ones that I'd already mentioned, so Dune and uh, Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, those would be my main ones. And I'm not going to recommend any more than that, because I don't want to overload the reader. But if you read those two, 
and it doesn't click for you and it doesn't make sense for you, then leave it. But if you feel something, if you feel an uncanny, gnawing little feeling in the back of your head saying, hold on, there's something here, read it again, do it a couple of times. And before you know it, you will, you will have a sight beyond sight. You will see things that I believe uh, this society that we find ourselves in has bred, beaten, and murdered out of us, and we would do well to reclaim. But then again, there's a different uh, quote that I remembered from, uh, I think the name of the film is Pirates of Somalia, and I think it came out in the last 10 years or so, but uh, Al Pacino plays this uh, elderly journalist, and uh, the the youthful uh, young guy protagonist of the movie asks him, like, hey, what books should I read to uh, to really get good at this stuff? And the old guy just looks at him, he, sa he says, nah, don't read books, fuck more girls. And <laughs> that's, uh, and I don't mean girls, like that's not the experience that, that you need, but, uh, you know, get into fights, uh, go go adventure, uh, broaden your horizons, do stuff that you're, uh, that you're not supposed to. Get afraid of something and then do it. Just the other day, a hornet flew through my window and, uh, and I'm deathly afraid of, uh, of hymenoptera, of, uh, of bees and bumblebees and hornets, etc. And uh, I was just sitting there, sitting right, right here where I am, looking at the window, and I was thinking, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta tackle this thing. And uh, and eventually, I just uh, walked up to it with a towel and uh, and crushed it. But then I thought that that wasn't good enough. Like I need to let that thing sting me. And when I let that thing sting me, then I'll know that my fear is gone. Because yeah, sure, I can I can crush it, I can trap it, I can let it out. All of that's fine, but really the only thing that will teach me anything and uh, that will give me long-term peace is knowing exactly what that pain is. Conflict and difficulty, all the way down to a bee sting, breeds greatness. I think that's a great way to end it. All right, Alexa. And what a pleasure. I appreciate you for your time. I appreciate you for your stories. I appreciate you for your determination and drive to create a legacy and create uh, generational freedom and generational heritage for your name. Alexa, can't thank you much. Thank you so much for having me on, James. Uh, I think you also mentioned something about uh, something about ways that people can find me uh, online and uh, and all of that. Uh, I'm always looking to connect to interesting people and uh, and get things going. Of course, and we'll we'll link that uh, Telegram link, I believe, down in the description for for anybody listening, as well as all the stuff that we talked about today. Uh, Alexa, thanks again, man. Thank you, man. You have a great day. You too.